one year ago today, George Floyd was murdered at the hands of the Minneapolis Police Department. I would like to hold space to honor Floyd, as well as the folks who have mourned and fought for communities, particularly Black and Brown communities that should be resourced and cared for and not subject to police surveillance, harassment, violence, and murder. We must be committed to accountability and doing work to evolve and transform our legal system in the US. For our Chicago residents, Grace will be dropping information below about the defund CPD route rally on Saturday. That being said, I'm looking forward to hearing what our panelists have to say tonight about the impact COVID has had on those who are incarcerated and on the greater pandemic response of the carceral system. Today, we'll be hearing from Neil Marquez, who is a public health research scientist with UCLA COVID Behind Bars Data Project, where he assists in the collection, harmonization, and research of COVID data related to carceral populations. His most recent work with the team, highlighted by the Prison Policy Initiative, has analyzed how the COVID-19 pandemic contributed to a four-year decline in life expectancy among the Florida State prison population. Neil has worked with a number of different research groups analyzing issues related to public health, including King County and Seattle Public Health, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, and the Mexico National Institute of Public Health. I would also like to introduce Katrina Fid, who has been organizing around issues of educational inequity and mass incarceration for several years. She has served as co-president of Students Against Incarceration and is the current communications and digital strategy manager at Chicago Votes and a member of the End Illinois Prison Lockdown Coalition. I'd also like to introduce Ronaldo Hudson, who is an educator, minister, and community organizer, and focuses his work on ending perpetual punishment in Illinois. After being sentenced to death row, Ronaldo worked for 37 years while incarcerated in the Illinois Department of Corrections, founding groundbreaking programs, including the prison newspaper Stateville Speaks and the Building Block Program a transformational program run by incarcerated people within the Illinois Department of Corrections. And all those work and life have been featured in media outlets throughout the state and are the subject of the documentary State Bell Calling. Lastly, I want to introduce Brian Dolinar, the managing editor of Prison Legal News and whose articles have appeared in Truthout, The Progressive, and In These Times. I want to deeply thank all of our panelists for speaking at this event tonight. We have a lot of really brilliant folks here and I'm excited to get this conversation started. We're going to start off with a list of prepared questions and then in the last 30 minutes, we're going to move to an audience Q&A. Please do drop any questions in the chat as they bubble up and Annie from Students Against Incarceration will handle them in the last 30 minutes of the panel. I also wanted to remind you all that this panel will be recorded for those who cannot make it tonight. That being said, I'm going to pass the mic off to Kappa's rising lead facilitator, Samir. We'll take it from here with the questions. Thank you, Samir. Thank you, Lauren. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Samir, uh, Samir Mohammed. I am the current treasurer of Kappa DePaul, and I'm going to be the future lead facilitator uh, next school year. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for coming out and listening to this um, event, and we're going to go ahead and get started. So the first question is directed towards all of the panelists. And the question is, can we get a brief overview of your work both before and during COVID-19? And then what has been your focus area to aid incarcerated communities? Ronaldo, if you'd like to go first. Well, if you insist, <laughs> listen, I'm, First of all, like the focus of my work right now is to educate the public about the tragedy of perpetual punishment. In other words, people dying in prison unnecessarily. And I think because people have been deemed as less than citizens, it's easy to throw away the key, the language they like to use. Get off of that cat. That cat is messing with my internet. I'm sorry. And so uh, my focus, since COVID-19, first of all, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, I was actually still in a prison cell. And so I was among my peers in a panic state. In fact, just to take you there for a quick second, uh, my feelings around the COVID-19 pandemic from a perspective of an incarcerated citizen was that it reminded me personally of when I was sitting on death row waiting to know if in fact 
the state of Illinois would legally have the right to exterminate me because there's no such thing as execution. It's extermination um, of human beings. But um, it was really, really horrible because fear, you can actually smell it, the uncertainty and then the indifference that existed among many people in a different kind of uniform, if you get my meaning, who felt that they didn't need to take precautions. And so they would be coughing and all the different things that would frighten anyone that doesn't really have a sense of their being protected. Uh, in terms of the work that I've been doing uh, in remembrance and being mindful of my peers, I've actually worked with the Department of Corrections and we've done training to help more of my peers within behind the walls to be vaccinated. So I've helped to facilitate a training course that they, they deemed the ambassadors of the vaccination ambassadors. And then we held a uh, town hall with all the prisons uh, uh, peer educators to educate them about the basics of, of COVID-19 and the potential of the impact of the virus to people who are not vaccinated. And then the last thing we did was we actually did a video with Director Jeffrey educating both, attempting to educate both our peers as well as staff. Well, 70% of the, the incarcerated citizens are vaccinated, but only 30% of staff. So I think we did a great job. We can debate about what Director Jeffrey did. And so that's basically where we are right now and moving forward. So I think that it is imperative that we stay the course and keep letting people know that if we don't get engaged and stay engaged, then our people die. Thank you. Katrina, do you wanna go next? Yeah, um, so hello everybody, Katrina Fid. Um, so when COVID first hit, I was still a DePaul student um, and a lot of my work um, was with SAI um, and immediately we um, were in communication and um, trying to pressure DePaul as an institution to take some immediate action given um, DePaul's relationship with Cook County Jail and Stateville Correctional Center um, through the Inside Out program. Um, so we had written petitions and things to get DePaul to first acknowledge that um, a part of their obligation in protecting all DePaul students includes their students in these facilities. Um, and then also help, um, at that time, it was uh, hand sanitizer, because that was like before we even knew like masks were really what um, the priority needed to be. Um, so that was the beginning um, and then uh, through my work at Chicago Votes um, and with some other alumni from SI, um, namely Rebecca Bretz, um, we founded the End Illinois Prison Lockdown Coalition. Um, and that coalition was formed in direct response to IDOC's um, failed attempt at stopping, uh, stopping the spread of the virus through uh, just lockdowns. Um, so our work, through that has been, again, just raising awareness of, about the issue um, to the public, hosting direct actions um, aimed at the governor who has um, all the power needed to grant clemencies um, and allow for mass release. Um, and then we've also been doing, we did a survey with the help of SAI and Parole Illinois um, to collect data on information from people um, inside prison so that we could have that uh, data instead of just anecdotes from people we work with um, to really back up all of our work. Thank you, Katrina. Um, Brian, did you want to go next? Hey, folks, I'm Brian Doliner, and thanks to Grace and Lauren and Samir and everybody for hosting us, uh, putting on this panel at DePaul and including me with uh, a lot of other great people doing super work. Um, I got involved um, just before the pandemic broke out. I started working with Parole Illinois, a nonprofit organization addressing long-term incarcer incarceration um, formed by 
mostly lifers in Stateville Prison and has board members in Logan Prison, the women's prison there as well. I started on as a staff member just before COVID broke out and um, so was able to play a role in the pushback within Illinois here from inside and from outside prison. Um, we held a pan we held a, a panel, a big Zoom event with, with a couple hundred people. It was called Prison is the Pandemic um, that really uh, tried to get the voices out. As Ronaldo mentions, there was a real deep sense of fear and absolute horror for people inside prison. And we tried to capture their voices. We got them on the phone. We got them um, you know, speaking before people uh, via Zoom. And um, we were able to record statements from people inside. And um, we were uh, brought together people you know, on the outside, family members, loved ones on the outside who spoke. And so that was a real critical piece of, of getting those voices out. Um, I'm also a writer. I'm currently a managing editor of Prison Legal News, and um, I write for Truth Out regularly. I was sort of following and listening what's going on inside jails and prisons. You know, during the post George Floyd protests, there inside the jails, there was a concern that people were getting locked up with COVID inside the jails amidst these massive protests. And in the fall, then um, COVID um, in its later phase really broke out. And so there was a great deal of concern. I was hearing horror stories out of Danville prison. I live in Urbana-Champaign and the Danville prison is just 30 minutes to the east of us, almost to the Indiana border. And I was hearing stories of massive outbreak in Danville. Um, I was hearing about the, the, the outbreak in Lawrence from my friend Pablo Mendoza. Um, the situation in, in, in Stateville where COVID cases were being locked up in the old F house, the old round house, the Panopticon, which is being used as like a COVID health ward, a shutdown facility. And so I started writing and getting the voices out. Eventually, as they started testing, and eventually they uh, uh, implemented the vaccine. And at one point, you know, where, where Danville had half of its people had COVID, we got to a situation now where there's like single digits in most every prison in Illinois. So there has been, a, as Renato said, a, a real progressive effort by the governor to respond. It came very late um, and, and due to public pressure from those on the inside and the outside. Um, and um, so, so that's, I think, the story we have to tell here uh, today. And we got to really tell the story uh, uh, elsewhere. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Brian. Um, Neil, did you want to go next? Yeah, totally. Um, I'm Neil Marquez. I'm with the uh, UCLA COVID Behind Bars team. Prior to working there, um, I worked with a subsidiary for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, as well as King County Public Health, where my work was really focused on highlighting um, disparities in health and wealth outcomes among the populations especially in light of adequate data that is normally needed in order to assess those differences. Um, so when the pandemic hit, um, a population of interest of mine that I do research with and that I'm also a part of is the Hispanic migrant population in the United States. And when, um, given that there had been all this previous literature on the risk of infectious disease um, within immigrant detention centers, even before COVID hit, it seemed natural that this was gonna be a population that was at extremely high risk. So I was really interested in working with teams that were focused on that. That's actually how I met Lauren. Um, we worked together on the immigration team at UCLA COVID Behind Bars. Um, but I also um, have a background in sort of like data analysis. And so I helped the team both collect um, and harmonize that data so that um, you don't have to go to these different websites um, that sort of obfuscate like what the pandemic like looks like uh, within different prison facilities or ICE detention centers or jails. We act as a centralized repository to compare facility level information um, as well as highlight when outbreaks are happening as well as compare um, how different locations are doing in terms of their data reporting and how often outbreaks happen and occur like that. And so I think that's what I'm here to talk about, just sort of what we've been seeing on the data side and what's been difficult to get access to and how many unknowns there still are um, in, the, in the sort of like US context of incarceration and COVID. Thank you, Neil. 
Um, so our next question is uh, also directed to all the panelists. Um, so this question is, what parameters or lack thereof in terms of COVID-19 protections in prisons and jails have you seen? Um, what are the safety measures being taken and what is lacking? Uh, Ronaldo, if you want to go first. Well, it's really, really hard because the precautions that they are, uh, they're taking are actually more suppressive uh, then they are protective. Like they're slowly, just a quick example, they're attempting to begin to open the prisons back up and yet staff is still unvaccinated. And so you have people who are paid by taxpayers' dollars, but yet refusing to vaccinate themselves to walk into a facility in which citizens are similar to the, in terms of the environment, to being in a senior citizen home. You cannot go anywhere to any job and say, I would think maybe I'm wrong. I'm going to get paid to protect people that I'm not protecting. I don't know, right? But yet they're still getting paid. They're not being fined. They're not being uh, uh, anything. It's just the union allowed whatever it is to make a stand against the very thing that they say they claim to protect. So they're putting up, like in the visiting rooms in the prisons, they're putting up petitions, which is a dangerous thing because they've always wanted to have non-contact visits. And so you have to be careful of allowing them to implement things under the, and I'm doing air quotes for some reason because I think it's cute, right? Uh, under the premise of, we want to keep people safe. So we're going to implement non-contact visits so that people are sitting in rooms screaming, trying to hear each other and not have an actual moment to really say to their loved one, I'm here to see you now. Is there anything you need to tell me that you couldn't tell me on the phone that I can go and get you some actual help? And so I don't see anything other than the normal like they're doing, they they still doing the mask. The 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 policies that govern the mask is really used more as a tactic to give staff more harassment power, because they will not wear their mask, but they'll jump on the incarcerated citizens for not having theirs, right? And so um, that's one area in which I'm not very optimistic about. I think that. We need to be allowed access to those facilities so that we can see ourselves what is actually being implemented. And that's not being allowed right now. And I think it's because we're not demanding that we get to see our loved ones. Thank you, Ronaldo. Um, Katrina, if you would like to go next. Yeah, um, so everything Ronaldo like, yes. Um, and then also through Chicago, both been able to go into Cook County Jail a few times. Um, the first time I went in during COVID was um, the end of October. So it was still when there was like, uh, it was kind of like the second wave going on. Um, and they take extremely like strict precautions for volunteers going in. Um, for voter registration. So we were, lim we were limited in the number of volunteers we were able to take. Um, we couldn't have symptoms. They took our temperature. We wore masks, shields, and gloves. Um, but then when you go in, the correctional officers aren't wearing their masks or they're wearing them below their chin. And when they see you, they like, oh, volunteers are in, we gotta pull them up. Um, so like that's happening in the jail. So of course it's happening in the prisons and we know for sure it is happening in the prisons because when we surveyed people across IDOC, I believe it was three fourths or four fifths of the people said that correctional officers are not wearing masks or not wearing them correctly. So um, we know that that's how it's being spread. Um, earlier in the uh, beginning of the pandemic last year, um, the ones are on lockdown. So they say like no movement for the protection of people. So you're not coming into contact with each other. 
Um, but at the same time, they would group people um, in the bullpens together. Um, they would do like group people to go shower. You know, they were showering like once every few days. Um, they randomly decided we need to retake everybody's photos in Stateville. So then they would move everybody around to get their photos taken, um, which it's like, why are you doing that? But they can't go outside for fresh air. Um, so that was happening. Um, other like precautions, like um, earlier to get a COVID test, like you had to have a certain temperature. Um, and we know not everybody who has COVID has a fever. So people were not being tested for it. So they were still in their cell with their celly passing it along. So a ton of precautions have been implemented, um, all punitive. Um, and they, they didn't stop the spread of COVID. The only reason COVID has declined in prisons and jails is because of a lawsuit that required IDOC and uh, the jails to be prioritized for vaccine distribution. And then a huge effort on the part of family members and everything to ensure people in prisons and jails had access to accurate information about the vaccines because correctional officers were, um, are still spreading false information about the vaccine. Um, and of course, when you only have limited information and the information you're hearing is from a correctional officer, like, like how are you supposed to know what's actually true? So, um, yeah, and now visits are slowly back. And um, I know in uh, Dixon, like for example, in the visiting room, you're at a circular table um, and there's two pieces of plexiglass in an X and you're sitting at both sides in like chairs that like don't move. So you're looking in these two crosses of plexiglass, you can't really see your loved one. And again, you're yelling so they can hear you. So you can't share personal information or information you don't want other people to hear. So um, that's kind of what's going on um, and things that I've heard. Uh, thank you, Katrina. Uh, Brian, uh, if you wanna go next. Yeah, a few things. Um, you know, the one, one thing, uh, you know, Katrina was part of the, and the Illinois coalition, coalition uh, and, the, and the Illinois Lockdown coalition is kind of a mouthful, um, but there was a protest of the lockdown, the extreme solitary that people were placed under, which was some like 23 and a half hours a day folks were locked down. Um, so that meant they got like 10, 15 minutes to make a phone call, uh, 10, 15 minutes to take a shower or vice versa. And um, otherwise they were locked down. There was some opening up of the summer and people had yard time, got to be outside. Um, but things locked down over the uh, over the winter, and um, and that was real hard on folks, real hard on folks. Um, so that was uh, a wave of rep repression that came throughout the IDOC and was implemented in in most of the jails, um, certainly the jails that I uh, uh, am familiar with in downstate Illinois here. Um, and indeed, it was the Alan Mills and the People's Law Office that um, had a lawsuit against IDOC and pressured them to one, implement mass testing. New Jersey was ahead of the curve in implementing testing. Um, mass testing was developed at Rutgers in New Jersey. We have it here at the University of Illinois um, in Urbana-Champaign. I've seen it uh, do a great deal to stop the spread of the pandemic, and so. Mass testing was around, it was an option, but it wasn't implemented until there was a, a massive outbreak in uh, December, January. Um, and, 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 and these could have really prevented lives. You know, there was some 80 plus people reported to have died in IDOC custody. Um, everybody I spoke to suspected that there were more people who have died due to the COVID. Um, there was mass testing and then um, pressure to implement the vaccine, which has been successful um, in Illinois. And, and again, we're ahead of most states. Um, I, in my reporting, I spoke to Lindsay Hess, the spokesperson for the IDOC, and the, the numbers for uh, people inside getting the vaccine, it was about 69% of people in Illinois, which is uh, ahead of the national curve. Elsewhere, it's like 30, 40, 50% of people got, in other states got the vaccine. The guards 
um, in April had a vaccine rate of 36%. I heard from Lindsay Hess yesterday, the rate is now 41%. Um, and across the US, my friend Barbara Kessel was asking, the rates for vaccination among guards is like 25%, 30%. So here we're actually, again, ahead of the curve in Illinois, um, but, but guards still um, who are Trump supporting, um, Republican um, have refused to take the vaccine and, and walk around, as others mentioned, you know, willy nilly spread, spreading COVID around in the prisons. Thank you, Brian. Um, Neil, if you if you like to go. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I think that um, well, one thing that um, our team has like been working on, and going back to your question of like what things are still unknown, um, one of the things that we try and keep track of is the information that the DOCs themselves report on, and uh, where we can glean uh, like can we get the information that we need to assess the epidemiological impact of COVID nineteen is having on prisons. Do we have that infection data? Do we have the testing data? Do we have the vaccination data? Um, and I'm glad that you brought up those vaccination numbers because I do want to point out vaccination numbers. When people get them, they come from extremely hard work when it's coming from Illinois um, DOCs because they don't make that information readily available to the public. You don't know when it's changed. When people reference these numbers, it could be from weeks, months, uh, months ago. So it's hard to get an idea. I, I know that these numbers right now are, are pretty up to date. But the fact that the, the DOC themselves aren't publishing that number and which facilities um, are more heavily vaccinated than others makes it extremely difficult to assess what's happening. Um, I think the other big thing um, that is uh, was talked a little bit earlier on by Ronaldo is um, the traumatic impact that all of this is going to have um, in terms of just mental health of um, prisoners, um, not just in Illinois, but across the state. Um, I think that a lot of the, the discussion in the public health realm has like really focused on the disproportionate impact um, that prisoners have faced, and rightly so. Prisoners are five times more likely to be infected, around three times more likely to be infected, two and a half more times likely to die from COVID-19 than individuals in the, in the more broader population. Um, but it's much harder to quantify the mental health impacts that have been going on and there's some great qualitative work that has like really dug into this um, in certain prisons, but it's very likely that this is occurring um, across across the U.S. And I think that's going to be a piece that people are going to be interested in and want to know about um, for for a time to come. And I think all of this just really highlights that prisons just aren't a a place to handle a pandemic. That they aren't readily available to um, protect individuals. Um, from getting infections and the strategies that they do take, the few states that have seen relatively low rates of infection have done so seemingly at the expense um, and the detriment to the mental health of the individuals who are under their supposed protection. Thank you, Neil. Um, our next question is directed towards Ronaldo. Um, and the question is, how has access to basic healthcare necessities changed under COVID-19? You mean in the prisons? Is that the question? Or versus, because it's totally different out here compared to being behind the wall. In prison, there is no healthcare. They call it healthcare. There is no such thing as healthcare in prison. Uh, there is a system by which you are, we are hurdled, like, like put in big uh, huddles, you know, and treat it very, very bad. It's really that simple. Like uh, people, I remember, and I was just talking to someone about this when they changed the law about copay, for example. They changed the law that we didn't no longer have to pay $5 to go see uh, a health professional, but they didn't change the policies that govern that system. And so when people think about this stuff, like people, use words loosely like systemic racism. What people have to understand is that I love the fact that COVID revealed how horrible things really were in the prison setting. When I came home after 37 years, people were saying to me little things like, boy, if you would have came home before COVID-19, it would have been a different experience. And I was like, uh, no, this was the right moment because I'm an activist. 
and I want to be engaged so that I can remind people of what's going on back there on them slave plantations that they call in prisons. And so people have to know there is, I will say this, and I don't apologize for it. I'm not going to try to sugarcoat it. There is no real health care in the Illinois Department of Corrections. There is a system of treatment which is different from health care. And I want to make one point because I remember when I was still in the prison doing when COVID hit to go to the mental health issue. In all of my years, I went from, I spent seven years in the county jail, 13 years on Illinois' death row, and 17 years serving life without the possibility of parole. And I never had a psychiatrist come to my cell, right, and ask me, how are you doing? I sent an email during the COVID outbreak. I sent an email to a friend that asked me a question, say, how are you doing? And I said to my friend, some of y'all know him, one of my best friends in the world, Bill Ryan. And he said, he asked me how I was doing. I said, brother, it reminds me of death row, the way things are right now, because we're listening to people get sick and then they never return. And people don't want to tell that story. It's one thing to look at numbers, but there's a difference to watch the bodies be carried out. And so I just want to remind people that these are the reason that the Department of Correction is able to do what they're doing is because the public has allowed them to make us villains and monsters and less than. And so we have to own our role in this also because we can turn and say that the, the, the Department of Corrections are such, such monsters, but they couldn't get away with it if we don't allow them. And that's why I want to keep saying that don't just talk about it, be about it. If you want to see real change, then you have to take actions. No such thing as healthcare in the Department of Corrections. Thank you, Ronaldo. Um, uh, our next question is directed towards Neil. And the question is, how have COVID infection rates in prisons, jails, and detention centers compared with the rest of the population? Uh, uh, yeah, so I mentioned earlier that infection rates uh, are looking to be about three times higher in prisons um, than in compared to the general population. Um, and that doesn't take into account the fact that there is huge underreporting in a lot of these prisons. Individuals aren't being provided not only with the adequate like medical um, treatment and protection that they would need in order to prevent themselves from getting COVID, but it takes a long time in order for an individual to try and get a test in most prison situations. Obviously, there's some variations across some different prison settings, um, but in general, um, prisons, it's a hard place um, to find out what the true number of confirmed cases is. So in all likelihood, it is much, much higher than the three times that the numbers would lead you to believe. Um, and I think that um, another, like, Another thing that we found that's kind of in, that like leads to this, and I think points to Ronaldo's point that um, we aren't seeing adequate like medical attention, if any at all, like in the prison settings. Um, in the general population, um, it's kind of understood that um, after you start becoming symptomatic, there is usually a, a 14 to like 28 day till time of death that is usually accounted for that epidemiologists like to like handle in. Um, from the prisons that we do see, the time that they reported a positive test to, until they eventually died for prisoners who had died, the time span was more than two or three days. These individuals like aren't being flagged um, for adequate treatment in enough time, nor are not let alone to prevent further outbreaks from happening. So I just want to point out there that like that is a huge thing that contributes not only to like individuals leading to higher rates of mortality, but again, then you lead to further spread. And that's why you have these numbers that are as high as they are. Um, I will say as staggering as it is in prisons, and it is very much staggering, it's even worse in immigrant detention centers across the US. Um, uh, their outbreaks have been extremely high. Um, and even more recently, they're seeing outbreaks higher than we've seen at any point um, across the, the over one year now that we've been in the pandemic as well. And this isn't at all to downplay like what's happening in prisons at all, but it just I think really highlights like another another group um, that hasn't been that uh, hasn't been paid attention to 
that has been allowed to get away with these extremely high rates of infection. And at this point, if you're in an ICE detention center, you're over 25 times more likely to get COVID than when, if you were outside of one, which is extremely staggering. Thank you, Neil. Um, our next question uh, is directed towards Ronaldo and Katrina. Um, and the question is, how has access to visitation as well as information coming in and out of the prison changed under COVID-19? And do you know if it, is, uh, if it is set to change again anytime soon? Uh, Ronaldo, if you want to go first. I'm actually, because uh, I was actually in Danville prison, just for the record, when I was released. Uh, the visitation, in fact, I had a friend that was going to visit uh, one of our friends that it keep being uh, canceled because right now, as we're speaking, there is a COVID outbreak at Danville Correctional Facility. And it's staff, once again, right, putting people at risk. Um, and so I am proud of this and I can't, and, and I will say this, I get multiple calls from facilities. And one of the consistent things, most persistent, consistent things is that uh, many of the peers say, I took the shot because I saw you on the video talking about the importance of taking the shot. And we're so glad that you guys are engaged in watching what DOC is doing with us. And so I have to take a moment, right, and say, I'm grateful that uh, we've been able to have that working relationship and organizations like Restore Justice and the Illinois Prison Project and Chicago Vote and all these different organizations that are working to make sure not just that we have forms like this and have academic conversations, but there's actual actions being taken to ensure that to the best of our ability, we ensure, you know what, I can't tell you what your medical condition is or what your reaction would be to this shot. But we do know that the COVID-19 was taking us out, right? And so I think it's, it's, it's vitally important that we just remember that if the visitation, which I'm telling you being stopped and canceled, right? Because of outbreaks for staff, then that's steady taking us back uh, 30 days and people are being are emotionally uh, 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 tormented of trying to get news from the world face to face, eyeball to eyeball. And so it's going to have a long term effect that DOC is not prepared for because they don't have the mental uh, health facilities or people that the population trusts to unpack their stuff with. Because there's another fact to say that they offer in services, but if I can't trust the person that show up at my door to ask me a question, how can I receive the services? Uh, thank you, Ronaldo. Uh, Katrina, if you would like to go next. Yeah, um, so for over a year, there were no visits, no in-person visits, period, in all the facilities. Um, that's still the case in Cook County Jail, I believe. Um, and then April 1st is when IDOC said that they would start visitation. Um, but April 1st rolled around and there was no way for people to sign up. So it slowly like trickled in. Um, and now they are um, offering in-person visits, um, but there's like a time limit. And of course there are no contact. Um, you can't hug your family member. You can't hold their hand um, and you're yelling to, across the divide. Um, during, throughout this, there have been um, video visits is what um, they have, people who have access to their tablets have been able to have. And that's kind of, um, IDOC was like, well, they have video visits, so there's no real rush for in-person visits. Um, but with video visits, uh, the you, you're limited in what you can say because you're always being recorded and like listened to and the connection is extremely poor. You have to pay for them. Um, you have to pay for them even though you like don't have money when you're in prison unless you're working for 18 cents an hour or your family member is sending you money. Um, uh, 
sometimes the video is cut out. So you're really just like looking at them and like, that's like all you get. Um, so that's happening. Um, and then I think uh, programming is another way that people have been able to like relay information previously um, and like have connections to people on the outside, but programming hadn't happened. Um, and I know like some educational programs were doing um, like mail-in schoolwork and things like that. Um, and they're slowly talking about bringing programming back into these facilities. Um, so I think this summer, uh, the public and advocates are really gonna like have to hold, hold stay on demanding that programming returns and insisting that when it comes back, they don't like limit it even more than it was before. Um, because like people need programs um, and that's like an issue outside of COVID, like before COVID, like people needed programs and Stateville shouldn't be the only correctional facility that has access to uh, like good programming. It shouldn't depend on your distance from Chicago. So um, that is something that people should really get involved in. And ILCHEP, Illinois Coalition for Higher Education in Prison is a good organization to get involved with if that's what you care about. And Chicago Boats too. Thank you, Katrina. Um, this next question is directed towards Brian. Um, and the question is, what obstacles have you run into while reporting on COVID-19 cases in incarcerated communities? Um, well, the most obvious obstacle is the authorities. You know, like one, trying to get any information out of these ICE jails is nearly impossible. <laughs> you know, and in places like far Southern Illinois, the Tri-County Pulaski Jail is, is so far away from anything, it's so remote. Um, you know, I, I've talked to some organizers in Carbondale who say there's been, you know, a few hundred people um, with COVID and there's some outreach there, but uh, those ice fields are really isolated um, from, and, 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 and the feds just aren't giving up any information. I've had numerous <laughs> FOIAs rejected. Um, you know, so, um, uh, you know, there's other uh, obstacles, but, um, you know, I think what's what's been best is, is those of us really keeping in contact with those on the inside and their families. So I wanna shout out Melly Rios, who's on the line here in the audience, um, who's been like really a lifeline for her husband, Benny Rios in Stateville prison, um, getting the word out of condition uh, conditions in there. As you know, Melly's telling me in the chat that like, they give people the mask when they do visitations, they give people a mask, but that they take out the little metal strip in the mask. Um, so nothing gets circulated. Um, so there's always there's all these ways in, in, in which uh, there's the repression being implemented, but that people inside and family and loved ones are really getting those experiences out to the world. And uh, they play such a, a critical role. Um, you know, and I would encourage everybody on the line here, you know, especially students out there, like the number one way, like the first way I got involved is to get a pen pal, you know, uh, reach out through, through, it was, I got my pen pals through my Books to Prisoners program here in town. And um, that's really a way you can strike up communication and, and it's helpful for people inside, but it's also helpful for people on the outside, just, just to understand on a daily basis everyday personal basis of, of what people are really living under. So that's my piece of advice. And Black and Pink, shout out to Black and Pink for sure. Thank you, Brian. Um, this next question is directed towards all the panelists again. Um, and the question is, what have you seen or reported on uh, if you do test positive for COVID-19 uh, has been the process for those incarcerated um, as well as for those in close contact with the individual who tests positive? Uh, Ronaldo, if you'd like to go first. Well, I've had friends to call me constantly, not just, just almost every day, like updating me on if someone next door is tested positive. Cause in Danville, what I know that they're doing is they have a weekly spot checking for COVID. And so they're randomly just going to the wings and doing the test. 
The problem is because it's not really regulated by the CDC, but it's being controlled by the D DOC, the Department of Corrections, then there's so much room for error. And so you have people that are not professionals testing people and you have bad tests or results, right? And so I think that um, the thing that scared me, I'll, I'll be honest, when my friends called me is that one, that people get misdiagnosed and then they get uprooted. And one of the things in the prison setting is that you kind of become a part of communities. And one of the things that the COVID has done is it shook everybody up. And because of that, it put DOC in a more powerful position because they have a tendency to create the atmosphere of everyone is adversarial. You can't be in relationship with anyone. And so um, I kind of went on a rabbit trail a little bit, but um, I think it's a dangerous thing because the way in which they're testing isn't necessarily a system that can actually be regulated. And it isn't being regulated in a way that we can trust. Like, I don't trust the fox in the hen house, but yet the fox is the one doing the test, right? In the Illinois Department of Corrections. And I think uh, we have to have our people go in more to act. And I know people are like, I ain't going there, but I would go if they let me so that people can know that there's people that actually care about them engaged in this process. And right now it's being completely regulated by the Department of Correction. That's why they can go into each prison is an island unto itself. So there is no one consistent policy. In one place they're putting up plexiglass like with uh, X's and other ones they're putting up like fences but you hauling through three inch, three inches of, of plastic and you can't even hear. So we have to get a system that actually is the same across the board so that everybody is being heard. But we have to make sure that we don't allow them to make it a consist, a continued policy of we will isolate you guys in order to say we're actually treating you guys. Isolation is not treatment. And that's the, the thing that they are actually using as a tactic. We'll isolate them and not treat them. Thank you, Ronaldo. Um, Katrina, if you'd like to go next. Yeah, um, I think Ronaldo's point about the lack of centralization is crucial to like everything like that. I, like we should have mentioned that probably in the beginning is like literally every prison is different and whatever like Jeffrey says at the top like doesn't necessarily mean each prison is going to follow that like it's really up to each warden on how things are going to be followed and then the correctional officers to figure out what they're going to do with that information so um, I know um, things have are always changing but I know like in some prisons they had like requirements to be tested. Like you couldn't just say, I want a COVID test. You had to like have some sort of symptoms, like your fever had to be above like 99 or something. Um, so you could have had COVID and spread it to your cellmate um, without the numbers actually representing that. Um, I know uh, in Dixon, um, a loved one got COVID and they were put in isolation for 10 days. Um, but then there's no, they didn't like retest them after the 10 days to ensure they didn't have COVID. And even they say like you're, um, like it might still show a false positive after 10 days. So that's not really accurate anyway. So like they'll put you in isolation for 10 days and then put you back in your cell. So even if you're still contagious, like you might still be spreading it. So there's just like a lot of lack of like actual input in the actual practices from health professionals. Um, and it just seems like IDOC is kind of just like doing what they want with the information. Um, so yeah, testing hasn't happened across the board to everybody. And um, like 
responses based on the tests really vary by prison. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, Brian, if you'd like to go next. Yeah, well, um, you know, the, as I mentioned, like the, mo the most crazy thing that happened uh, that I heard was in Stateville, you know, people who they got COVID, they put them in the F house. That place had been shut down for a few years and they reopened the F house, the old round house and put people in the F house. The one thing you need if you get COVID is water. They did not have running water in the F house and uh, people were made to buy their own water. They could only spend half as much on commissary. Um, so it's just absurd situation. Um, and, uh, and, and this is the response of the IDOC. So, um, you know, there just needs to be continuing pressure and continuing pressure now um, to improve the conditions um, and to open things back up. You know, there needs a real plan for visitations um, there is no plan. We're about at the 60 day, uh, about the 60, 60 days is about to expire, you know, and there's no real plan from the IDOC of what's going to open up with visitations. If, if both people got the vaccine, they still can't see one another, a hug, touch, no nothing. Um, so, so, so they need a real plan. Um, I think that's all I got to say on that piece. Thank you, Brian. Um, Neil, if you would like to go next. Yeah, so the, the CDC has like some of the strongest, most authoritative emergency powers that it has like under its belt um, that it can enact. And the time that it would enact it would be in a global pandemic. This is exactly when you could expect them to say, we, want, we need certain groups or certain people to, be, to do this, right? So when that happened, I think there were some ideas on like, okay, how far is the CDC going to go and the recommendations that it makes? Um, and in regards to carceral settings, prisons, detention centers, it was a very, in my eyes, and I think a lot of public people, health people's eyes, like a very weak recommendation. They set up guidelines for what testing should look like. They set up guidelines for what you should be doing in order to prevent spread. Um, but there was no oversight there was no groups who were going into making sure any prison system across the US, let alone individual facilities, were going to be doing this. And if you go to every single state DOC, all of them are saying they're following CDC guidelines. You know, um, And it's clear now at this point that none of them are, and they're not going to unless there is like more thorough oversight that's going to be happening. But I think it gets worse than that too, because even if you had well-intentioned actors, which from the other panelists, like we've heard, that is not the case at all. But even in the hypothetical situation where you had well-intentioned actors and people were looking to prevent spread of COVID in carceral settings and in prisons, prisons just aren't built to stop a pandemic. They don't allow the space, they don't have the engineering, they don't have the ability to get access to medical care in order to handle a COVID pandemic, that the likes that we had seen this year. And I think that's what we're seeing all of the evidence in on top of the fact that we have individuals who are not um, adhering to the even the soft guidelines that the CDC has been putting out. Thank you, Neil. Um, and then actually, we actually have two questions for Neil uh, right now. Uh, the first question is, uh, what has data collection looked like for the, uh, what has data collection looked like for the UCLA COVID-19 behind bars data project? Yeah, so um, the link that I sent earlier is based off of what DOCs themselves produce. Um, so some DOCs have been putting information out there among individuals who um, are in the prison legal system, who are incarcerated, and so we collect that information where it's presented by the DOCs and give them a scorecard in just our ability to assess the, epidemic or the epidemiological impact of what's happening to the prison population. Nothing to say about like the health impacts that those facilities have said, because that's just how difficult it is to like get to that information. Um, in addition, we also have to go through other mechanisms, some that Brian mentioned, we're sending out constant FOIA requests in order to get access to information which DOCs and ICE detention centers aren't making readily available. 
we know X number of prison cases uh, happen, uh, X number of cases happen in a prison, but without knowing how many people are there, we have no idea how to gauge the size of the impact and how much, um, how much of an outbreak this is. And so we report on that, we try and get that information out there so we can link it to people on the ground who have a better sense of this and they can use it for like advocacy. Um, but this work require the, the data that we do collect is sort of like this mixture of like, we're at the mercy of like what the DOC um, produces. And also when they don't provide us with data, the minimum data that we see as adequate in order to report on this going through FOIA requests. Thank you. Um, actually, I think you kind of answered this next question, but have there been any notable public uh, at the federal or state level or private barriers to acquiring this kind of data? Um, the biggest one right now, and again, it was mentioned earlier, so I feel like I'm just going on again, is that like, um, especially for staff data, staff information, um, many prisons and especially ICE detention centers have been extremely difficult to try and get any of that information. And as other members on the panel said earlier, staff aren't the, are the primary mechanism for bringing COVID into prisons and ICE detention centers, but they're also the primary mechanism for bringing it out. And we know that outbreaks in prisons are, um, are connected to outbreaks in the general population. There was that huge study that happened in the Cook County Jail that linked a large number of cases um, in, the, in the jail setting to the general population. We know this is happening in ICE detention centers as well. Um, so I think that getting access to that like staff data has, um, has been extremely tricky. Um, and as the, the reason that I bring that up in relationship to the private um, public prison question too, is because the guys that a lot of um, these groups are using is that, oh, we contract this prison workout or this detention workout. So we're not responsible for reporting that information, um, which is absurd to me that you, you can contract that information out and now you're free from a FOIA request. Um, I don't think any other, I've seen any other agency respond in that sort of way. Um, and I think it, it speaks to like how much the prison systems think that like they're, they, they can just be above this because no one's going to kind of hold them accountable. Thank you, Neil. Uh, now this is our final question. And this question is directed towards all of the panelists once again. Um, our, the questions are, uh, what can we do as outsiders to support uh, incarcerated communities? And what action steps can we take? Uh, Ronaldo, if you would like to go first. Absolutely. I love when the brother said that earlier about uh, pen pals. I have uh, pen pals that stayed with me 25 years. And I had the opportunity to sit and drink coffee and eat sam uh, 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 a hamburger with one of my friends recently, uh, just to say thank you. And what people need to know is just knowing that someone cares enough to write you could be an extremely important anchor to hook your, you know, just to put like put a peg out and say, listen, if no one else liked me, this person liked me because they're taking the time to write me, right? I also would say to people, like, put your money where your mouth is, right? Instead of that cup of stop uh, Starbucks, right? Donate to Chicago Vote. Instead of that cup of Starbucks, donate to the Illinois Prison Project, which is the best organization in the world. I happen to be the director of education over there, right? But these are organizations that are doing extremely great work, right? I would encourage people just to reach out and just check, you know, to see what where, where, where do I fit in this movement? Because all of us fit somewhere. And so I would encourage people just to look around and say, hey, what can I do to make the world a little better? It may sound corny, but if it's writing a letter to someone, I'm telling you, my pen pal helped me to hold on for all those years. And I was able to say, hey, thank you for loving me when I didn't necessarily know how to love myself. So. Uh, those may seem like little things, but they're big things. $5 can make a difference. People may say, why are you talking about money? Because gas don't, cars don't move without gas. These organizations don't move without cash. And so people need to understand that, right? And so thank you. I want to let y'all know I love you. I appreciate the Paul. 
Like, I'll be back if y'all invite me back, right? There's a lot to discuss, right? Because we got an election coming and a whole lot of other stuff. And we want to make sure that the midterm don't make us lose all the ground that we've gained, okay? But anyway, uh, find somebody to love. That's the best I can put it. Thank you, Ronaldo. Uh, Katrina, if you like to go next. Yeah, um, I think that the first thing to do, especially um, assuming you're a DePaul student, is recognize your privilege um, and the fact that you might not be directly impacted. So you probably should not be leading the work. It, you need to be giving that space to someone who is directly impacted. Um, and you need to be uplifting the voices of people who are directly impacted and make sure you're in community with them, talking to them, become a pen pal. That's a great way to know what's actually going on. Um, become part of an organization because organizations, good organizations should be led by people directly impacted um, and people in communication with people on the inside. So join organizations. Um, have conversations with your friends and family. I think that's one thing we overlook a lot, especially like, like as college students um, and people doing the work is like your friends and family are either part of the problem or part of the solution. So you better make sure they're part of the solution. And that is your responsibility now that you have this information. Like you have to go and talk to your parents and be like, are you perpetuating racist systems? And you have to break that down to them. Like you have a responsibility because at some point, like we can't just anymore like walk away from our like racist family members. Like at some point you have to like have those conversations. That's super important. Um, I think another thing in terms of like policy and when we're at activate or advocating for certain things. Um, I know in the beginning of the beginning of the pandemic, a big thing was like free all nonviolent people. Um, and like, that was the big, like free all the nonviolent people, like that's problematic. Um, and like, that is one of the biggest obstacles to any policy people try and pass, um, is that narrative that only people with nonviolent offenses are deserving of like any sort of release or understanding of like redemption. Um, so when you're doing the work, make sure like that's not the framework you're working with um, because uh, we have a ton of people in prisons and jails that are in there for quote unquote violent offenses that also deserve to be a part of the work um, and to be addressed in all of our solutions. So that's what I have to say, but thank you for having me. I love SAI and I love Ronaldo. So any chance I have to be with Ronaldo, I accept. <laughs> Thank you, Katrina. Uh, Brian, if you'd like to go next. Yeah, I'd just like to stress again that it's important to get involved with the organization. You know, you can move as one, but when you move with others, you're much stronger. So find an organization to get plugged into. You know, I make a pitch for Parole Illinois, which is currently in Springfield trying to pass our bill HB 2399 to reinstitute parole. We do not have effective parole program in Illinois. We're trying to bring it back. Um, so we are in Springfield right now trying to make that happen. It's like now or never, it's in the next week or it's not gonna happen until next year when it's gonna happen. Um, so Parole Illinois does a lot of work with people inside. The board is made up of uh, people inside prison. Shout out to Joe Dole and Raul Dorado, co-founders of Parole Illinois. Um, and to all the people working on the outside, families and loved ones, um, Lauren Metlock, um, um, and, and you know, I want to shout out to you know, you know, those who aren't with us. You know, I just want to shout out a couple people: um, Brian Nelson and Greg Coger, two of my friends who were lost this last year because of the long-term time they did in solitary confinement, and they both passed away during the pandemic because um, because the prison's out here too. So um, so. Just uh, much peace and love to everybody on the line here. And, and thanks to Paul students for bringing us together. Thank you, Brian. Um, Neil, if you would uh, like to conclude. That's unfortunate because I'm not going to say anything as good as has half as good <laughs> as what everyone else has said. Um, I will say um, that getting involved with organizations is the way to go. 
And the big thing that ha has been, uh, I think that you should take away is this isn't a COVID problem. Um, this isn't something that's isolated to this time. Um, this has been built into the institutions. And if you analyze it from a health perspective, you analyze it from an economic perspective, you analyze it from an ethics perspective, um, there's huge issues that are happening with carceration uh, in the United States. And so I'd urge you to get involved with the organizations that are looked at tackling that and not seeing this as just like an independent COVID issue, but really like this is just one more manifestation of the carceral setting um, and leading to the detriment of lives of individuals. Thank you, Neil. And thank you once again to all of the panelists. Those were all very informative and very thoughtful responses. Um, now with the conclusion of the prepared questions, I'm going to kick it off to Annie for any uh, audience uh, questions for the panelists. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think we had one question earlier. Um, we can try to make it quick. So if anyone has um, any thoughts, we had a question. The question is, what have you learned throughout the pandemic that has affected your organizing um, and or what is something that you learned that you will take with you to further transform and evolve your cause? So if anyone has any thoughts on that to kind of close us up. I would say, don't take anyone for granted. Every voice matters. And it's so easy to minimize the voices of people. I've learned that every voice matters. Even little Harriet Tubman, right? Harriet Tubman say free them all. And so every voice matters. I can't say that enough. And I've learned that. And I use that as a reminder as I move through my mission and my call that I don't take it for granted that I have opportunities to speak in moments like this because you never know who's listening. That's why we should always be ready to share with people the mission. And I love working with you too, Trina. So every time I see you on a panel, I'm gonna be there. But, and Chicago vote, like Parole, Illinois, I love y'all too. So don't be getting all sensitive on me and stuff. Y'all my people too. But anyway, every voice matters. And I learned to make sure to never take anyone for granted. And that is my takeaway. Beautiful. Um, thank you so much for your thoughts and responses. So yeah, we just wanna thank everyone um, so much for coming. We know we are a little bit over time. So thank you for everyone who took time out of their night. Thank you to our panelists, Ronaldo, Neil, Katrina, and Brian for sharing all of your knowledge and suggestions. Um, we really, really appreciate it so much. We are going to drop some links and information in the chat um, with information, other events and organizations to help support um, our speakers and their orgs so be on the lookout for that um but yeah thank you so much for coming thank you everyone lauren will be posting those links in the chat shortly um just to close out tonight please feel free to email kappa depaul with any questions about this event at depaul chai peace action thank you to my kappa depaul co-president lauren uh kappa depaul's future lead facilitator samir Annie from Students Against Incarceration, all of our panelists and everyone who helped bring this event to fruition. Let's continue to take action in support of our incarcerated individuals and remember the hard work and organizing is constantly happening both inside and outside of our prisons in order to build a future free of incarceration and punitive action. We must always also be cognizant of the US domestic police forces being trained by the IDF, what we do for the liberation and freedom of our own people, we must do for those suffering similar violence. All those require building an international movement in solidarity with our Palestinian community members. Capital Paul stands in solidarity with students for justice in Palestine now and forever. In the chat is the link to, is the link to tomorrow's event, socially distanced teach in the ongoing Nakba in Logan Square presented by students for justice in Palestine, Chicago. Solidarity is needed now, now more than ever. Thank you everyone and have a good night. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye, thanks.